Hi everyone, it's Katrina. Number 10. Amphitheater of El Jem. The Amphitheater of El Jem is a very important piece of Roman history in North Africa. It was built in the likeness of Rome's Colosseum without being an exact copy. Like most Roman amphitheaters, it was constructed to hold a huge number of spectators, who would fill the seats during gladiator battles, lectures, plays, and all kinds of other forms of entertainment. This particular amphitheater could hold 35,000 people. It's currently a shell of its former self, largely ruined in an empty plain in the small Tunisian village of El Jim. Still, the structure is extremely impressive. It was built in the 3rd century AD and doesn't even have a foundation. It was constructed entirely of huge stone blocks, making it one of the earliest free-standing structures in North Africa from the late days of the empire. In fact, UNESCO says it's one of the largest amphitheaters in the entire world. Even though much of it has crumbled, huge parts are still perfectly intact, like the podium, the arena, and the underground passages where all of the behind-the-scenes activity went on. Although the current village of El Jem is small, it was once a thriving metropolis. It was once called Thisdras, a powerful Roman city. It's worth noting that the amphitheater was also the third one built in the same place. Two other amphitheaters fell down before this one finally remained standing. Then, in the Middle Ages, it was used as a fortress. The locals hid inside the amphitheater and its underground passages when the Vandals attacked in 430, then again when the Arabs invaded in 647. More recently, though, in the 18th and 19th centuries, the ruins of the amphitheater were used in saltpeter manufacturing. So, yeah, this place has been through a lot. Be honest. If Rome brought back the events that took place in the Colosseum, would you go see the show, Death at All? Let me know in the comments below. And while you're on it, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Number 9. Um Er Rasas Um Er Rasas is an ancient ruin located in central Jordan, near the even more ancient city of Petra, yet the two sites have no connection. Um Er Rasas may or may not have been the biblical settlement of Mephat from the book of Jeremiah, but in all honesty, it depends on which biblical scholar you're talking to. We know this site was likely built during the 5th century AD and could only be accessed by one of the branches of the legendary King's Highway. The city was constructed way out in the Jordanian desert, a place so hot and inhospitable it isn't even home to that many animals. The King's Highway was the ancient trading route in the Middle Ages that moved from Africa up into Mesopotamia. It also branched into Egypt and to Damascus, allowing trade to easily flow through the region. Near the end of the Roman Empire, the Romans briefly used the site as a military outpost. Then it was taken over by the Christians and again by the Muslims. Most of its ruins date to the Byzantine period and the early Islamic period of the 7th century AD. Even though there were excavations carried out here in the 1980s, the archaeological site has largely been ignored. Most of the ruins are still covered in rubble and debris, with much of the lost city still buried under the desert sand. And now for number 8. But first, I want to give a big shout out to Holly, Titor, and Vovo, or is it VOVO? Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. Number 8. The Fort of Londinium There is an ancient Roman fortress standing in the middle of the modern city of London. It's hard to imagine, but this ancient ruin dates back to a time when London was called Londinium. The city was established in the year 47 AD at the edge of the River Thames, because it could be used by the Romans as a commercial port. As Romans continued to arrive in the British Isles from mainland Europe, Londinium expanded. It became an important center of commerce, then was utterly obliterated by rebel Queen Boudica of the local Iceni culture. The Iceni were outraged at the Romans for invading their lands and setting up their own city, and so they destroyed it in 60 AD. A temporary fort was built afterward, and Queen Bodega was defeated. As a result, Londinium grew rapidly once more and became an international city of renown. 
Most of Londinium is gone, buried beneath the modern skyscrapers and housing projects of London. But there is still one piece of the original fortress standing, a chunk of city wall built after the defeat of Bodica. It can be found on present-day Fenchurch Street, an old hunk of grey and black brick dating back to the earliest origins of London. If only this rock could talk! Number 7. Sacred Center of Polynesia Mare Tapu Tapuatea was once the sacred center of Polynesia. It's an ancient ruin perched at the edge of Raiatea Island's southeastern coastline. It's situated in a place that looks like it belongs in a Jurassic Park movie, an ancient island forest with the secrets of its extinct civilization buried within the surrounding hills and mountains. The ceremonial center is in the middle of what's called the Polynesian Triangle, stretching from Hawaii to New Zealand and all the way to Easter Island. It's believed that hundreds of years ago, people traveled from all across Polynesia to meet at Mare Tapu Tapuatea. And here, once the priests, chiefs, and the greatest warriors were gathered, there would be a great ceremony dedicated to Oro, the god of war. The history of this ancient island is so obscure that historians aren't entirely sure what happened here. They believe there were once human and animal sacrifices that took place that were then offered up to the gods. The island of Raiatea is still considered the ancestral home of all Polynesians. These days, there is not much left of the ruined sanctuary. There's a floor of stone, a handful of crumbling walls, and some eroded statues, but that's pretty much it. The sanctuary was likely established around the year 1000, and it was sometimes used for things other than bloody sacrifices. This may have been a meeting place for navigators all over the Pacific, and somewhere that priests from other islands could come to learn about the gods. It was in the late 18th century that the people living here fled following a fight between high priests. In 1763, warriors traveled from Bora Bora and completely destroyed the sacred temple. Number 6. Nalanda Gedige Nalanda Gedige is considered one of the most spectacular archaeological sites in Sri Lanka. It receives almost no tourists because of its remote location, which is deep in the sweltering jungle. The ancient shrine is said to be a place with no history. Nobody knows who built the shrine or why it was constructed in such a seemingly vacant area, and it's also a mystery as to why it was abandoned. The best guess archaeologists have is that it was created sometime between the 7th and 11th centuries, during a period when the kings of India were trying to take over Sri Lanka and overthrow local rulers. Because of the site's unique blend of Hinduism and Buddhism, it's been speculated the Nalanda Shrine was made as a fusion between the Tamil culture of India and the Sinhalese culture of Sri Lanka. The site was lost to the jungle until 1983, when archaeologist H. C. P. Bell rediscovered it. The shrine was found tucked away near some paddy fields and was surrounded by low hills and isolated forest villages. Bell had some big plans to restore the shrine and do additional digs at the site, but nothing ever happened. Nobody even took notice of Nalanda Gedige again until the 1980s when it was almost flooded. The shrine had to be dismantled and rebuilt on a retaining wall, but we still don't know anything about the remarkable structure's history. Number 5. The Athenian Agora The Agora of Athens is an ancient gathering place where the free citizens of Athens met between the 13th and 4th centuries BC. It was one of the most important places in the Mediterranean world, starting out as a local meeting place where people could hear military orders and proclamations from the ruling king. As the years went on, the ancient Agora became the primary meeting ground for important Athenians, and ordinary people too. Some of the first democratic groups met here, discussing how to properly run a democratic nation. There were also famous philosophers who gathered here to discuss the unsolved riddles of the universe. The Agora was a sacred place, centered on the Panathenaic Way, an ancient road that ran through the center of Athens to the city gate at Dipilon. But this wasn't the only Agora in antiquity. There were public meeting places throughout Turkey, Greece, Italy, and other areas where free societies prospered. The Athenian Agora is so important 
because Athens is generally agreed to be the place where democracy was born. People would meet in this sacred landscape the same way modern folks meet for a walk in the park. Only they were literally shaping the ancient world. The Agora was also home to the legendary Temple of Hephaestus, and smaller temples dedicated to gods such as Zeus, Apollo, Ares, and Athena. There were even fountains and statues as well as incredible columns where men and women strolled in the shade. Sounds pretty nice, huh? Number 4. Neolithic Ireland Irish National Heritage Park is a place that transports you back through time. Not only does the park take you on a journey through Irish history, but it also brings you all the way back to the Mesolithic era. The park has 16 recreated sites, starting with two totally rebuilt structures from 9000 BC. There is a small teepee-like structure made from thatch and sticks, which experts say was a typical house in Ireland 11,000 years ago. This thatch structure is known as a Howick house. There is another site in the Heritage Park where you can find a Neolithic longhouse, something that was built about 6,000 years ago. People had just moved from the coastal regions of Ireland to the interior and were beginning to farm the land. Individuals who lived in these longhouses were the first to cultivate things like wheat and barley in Ireland and were also among the first to practice animal husbandry. It was around this time that people in Ireland began experimenting with megalithic monuments. There are over 1,000 megalithic structures still spread across the Irish landscape. There are far too many to get into, but some great examples include the Portal Tomb at Ballykeel and the Dromberg Stone Circle in County Cork. Both these types of stone structures are represented in the Heritage Park. The park itself isn't exactly ancient. It opened in the summer of 1987 on 40 acres of reclaimed marshland. The park is on the site of a ferry crossing that functioned for about 1,000 years outside the ancient town of Kerrig. But the main draw of the park is that it showcases the full history of ancient Ireland up until the Norman invasion of the 11th century. It even has a fully period-accurate Neolithic village just as it would have looked like 1,500 years ago. Number 3. Tuzigut Arizona was mostly populated by nomadic groups of Native Americans 1,600 years ago. One such group was the Sinagua, a pre-Columbian culture that lived near modern-day Flagstaff. They dominated a huge piece of the Arizona wasteland between the Little Colorado River and the Verde River, along with chunks of land around San Francisco Mountain. One of the only monuments that was built by the Sinagua that's still standing is Tuzigut. Tuzigut was first excavated by Edward Spicer and Louis K. Wood from the University of Arizona in 1933. It was one of the first major archaeological sites in Arizona to be prepared for public display. There was a museum installed and a visitor center was created as well. Then, in 1939, President Roosevelt designated the ruins a U.S. national monument. But the real history starts around 1125 AD, when the Sinagua built Tuzigut 120 feet above the Verde River floodplain. They constructed what could almost be considered a castle. It's a huge complex of stone rooms constructed over the bulge of a natural outcrop looking out over the floodplains. It's believed these rooms served some sort of public function. There are over 110 of them though their purpose is largely a mystery. None of the rooms had doors, but were instead accessible by trap doors in the ceiling. This was one of the last great monuments built by the Sinagua culture. They first appeared around 650 AD, then went through several phases and moved around the deserts of Arizona. But Tuzigut was the last great thing they built before they left the area in the 15th century, never to return. Number 2. Ancient Argos Argos can be found in Peloponnese, Greece. Its few ruins are all that remain of the proud Mycenaean settlement that flourished here in the Bronze Age starting around 1700 BC. The Mycenaeans were the first truly advanced Greek civilization to thrive on the mainland. They created magical works of art and came up with their own writing system. And they even sent Greece down the path of urban organization. There was also the Minoan civilization of Crete, but they were isolated on their small island. 
The Mycenaeans ultimately died when the Bronze Age came to a violent collapse in the 12th century BC. Historians aren't entirely sure what happened, but a huge majority of civilizations in the Mediterranean ended at the same time. Many researchers have credited the mysterious sea people with the Bronze Age apocalypse, but again, this hypothesis has never been confirmed. When the Bronze Age ended, the mighty city of Argos lived on. The site had already been inhabited since prehistoric times, going back roughly 5,000 years. Even after the Mycenaeans were gone, the city somehow survived. It reached its peak in the 7th century BC under the notorious King Phaidon of Argos. It survived the Classical period and the Roman period, and then it finally met its end at the hands of the Visigoths in 395. Number 1. Porta Nigra Porta Nigra, or the Black Gate, is exactly what it sounds like. It's an almost perfectly preserved gate from the days of the Roman Empire, standing in the German city of Trier. It was originally constructed from massive blocks of sandstone. When it was built 1,900 years ago, the gate would have been a light color, like pale sand. But then, in the Middle Ages, something happened that caused the limestone blocks to darken, giving the gate its nickname. In the 2nd century AD, Trier didn't exist, and neither did Germany. The gate stood at the front of the Roman city of Augusta Treverorum. It was one of four main gates, though the others were obliterated long ago. When Napoleon Bonaparte saw the gate in 1804, during his failed attempt at conquering the world, he demanded it be restored to its former glory. And while it was partly refurbished, the Black Gate is still an ancient Roman creation. It's also one of very few Roman ruins that can be found in Germany. This is because most of modern Germany was beyond the borders of the empire. Thanks for watching! Which of these amazing ancient places did you find the most impressive? Let me know in the comments below! And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe! See you later! Bye!